we're, con- we're kind of restarting our series in, in John's Gospel. We did um, a few weeks before, uh, just at the beginning of the year, and we're going to do um, the next few weeks up until Easter, and then we're going to have a break from John's Gospel and do something else. Um, so Karen's going to, to read from John chapter 3. If you have a, a Bible, have a, a look at John chapter 3. This is uh, a reading from John 3, verses 1 to 15. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, No one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they're old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do, not, and do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the stake in the wilderness, So the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Karen. It's a um, a huge, there's a huge amount of information in there, so we're not going to be able to cover it all. You might be glad to know. Um, So I'm just going to have to draw out certain themes, but it's really worth... um, having a look at. If you're in a small group, definitely have a look at it before small group night, whatever it is next week, and and look at some of the other themes that I will not touch on. But before we do just dive in, let's uh, just pray together. Father, we come to your word with all the, the noise and with all the lies I pray that this time would be a time of quietness, of stillness, where we hear only truth. I pray that you would speak to us, that we would be transformed, and that we would be more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Claire and I are going to um, Livy's graduation this week. She graduates on Friday. Yeah. And uh, afterwards, we're we're going out for a a meal, and we're kind of taking time just to celebrate um, her success. And we're really delighted to be doing that. And I'm also uh, thinking I'm celebrating for another reason, and I'm sure Claire is with me, because it feels like... We can tick a box and go, yep, we've done it at last. They're kind of, we've made it. We've had, we've raised two children. We've survived thus far. Surely that's a kind of tick box, a success. Both have got through their education and through uni. Both are lovely most of the time. One has moved out, definitely success on that one, I must admit, you know, yes. And so we have success. 
And I don't know, um, though, if thinking about surviving is the way we should measure success. I'm not sure. And I was looking up um, some websites, and you know, there's loads of websites and magazines about what it means to be successful. And I was reading one website, and it kind of gave a, a 10 part. Uh, plan, 10-point plan on how to be successful in life, and I quote, this is what it said, stay single, close your personal social media accounts, and brush your teeth while showering. Now, that was one of the points in how to be successful, and it made me think, okay, what is our measuring stick of what makes a successful life? You know, if you watch Saturday Night TV at all, Winning a song contest, one of the many that are on, seems to be the measure of success that people have. But for you, what is your measure of success? Is it your child graduating? Is it fame? Is it wealth? Is it being married? Is it just having children? Is it having lots of stuff? I read this while preparing. He who dies with the most toys wins. Is that really success? Well, the the Webster Dictionary actually defines success as this. The fact of getting or achieving wealth, respect, or fame. But is that really what we want to say success is? So in trying to answer, that's a kind of big question I want us to think about this morning, is can we learn something from Nicodemus here and his meeting with Jesus? So if we look just at verse 1, (coughs) it says there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish council. The first thing we we learn, apart from his name, is that he is a Pharisee. Now, if you've been around church much, you'll know that the Pharisees were the kind of baddies in the New Testament. And we have this impression that they're not really good people uh, because they kind of argued with Jesus a lot. They didn't really like and get on with Jesus. And so we're often quite hard on the Pharisees, but to be honest, there's probably nobody in this room who could live up to the standards of morality that the Pharisees had. You see, not everybody could just be a Pharisee. There's, at one time, there could only be about 6,000 Pharisees. And this means Nicodemus was kind of part of the elite in the, the community in Israel at the time. And to become a Pharisee, Nicodemus had had to make this vow, a solemn vow, before God and three witnesses. And the vow was saying that he would devote his entire life, every second of every minute of every day, to keeping the Ten Commandments. That was his goal in life, and that was how he would be measuring success. But as you can imagine, doing this is really hard. And so they wanted to keep the Ten Commandments so accurately, what the, the Pharisees did, they had within them a group called the scribes. So within the 6,000, there's this group called the scribes. And the scribes' job was to write down rules and laws and regulations that would help people keep the Ten Commandments. So they would try and write rules and applications and for all the different circumstances and events that would come up in daily life to make sure you could keep the Ten Commandments. So it wasn't just a general don't murder. It kind of covered lots and lots of different things. And so the scribes, they wrote all this down in a book called the Mishnah. And an idea just to give you how detailed the Mishnah was, just think about the fourth commandment, keeping the the Sabbath holy. Well, there are 24 chapters in the Mishnah just about keeping the Sabbath day holy. However, for the Pharisees, for the scribes, this was not enough. Because they thought, okay, how do we now interpret the Mishnah? So it's just layer on layer on layer of rules. So they wrote something called the Talmud, which interpreted the Mishnah. And for this one rule of keeping the Sabbath day holy, 24 chapters, but in the Talmud, there's 128 pages on just keeping the Sabbath day holy. So you can see the level of detail and devotion they're giving, and this is just to the one commandment. So this commandment, do not work on the Sabbath. So how do you know if you're working or not? That was the question. For instance, they thought a lot about 
tying knots. Okay. How would you know if tying a knot was work or not? Now, maybe that's not such a problem for us because we have Velcro on our shoes even nowadays, but they didn't have the magic of Velcro. So how would you know? So they, they decided that if tying a knot was absolutely necessary for human life, then you could tie a knot. But if it wasn't, then you couldn't tie a knot. Ah, but then it got even more complex. So for instance, if I wanted to get some water from the well, I had to do it the day before the Sabbath because they reckoned that if you went to the well and you had your rope and your bucket and you tied the knot and you put it down, well, that wasn't necessary because you could survive a day without water. And so tying that knot was not necessary. So that's what the law said. But the Talmud also said that if a woman wanted to tie a knot in her girdle, then she could, because that was deemed necessary for the survival of human life. <laughs> Fascinating. I've, I've had a great week. <laughs> but to me, the hilarious thing about this is these creative men found ways to get round the laws. The Talmud said you cannot tie a knot in the rope, but it can be tied in a girdle. So if I was thirsty and I wanted to get some water out the well, how would I do that? Well, I would get one of my wife's girdles and I would tie a knot in the girdle and I could then lower the bucket into the well. And that is what they did. And that is, you can still read that in the Talmud today. And for the Pharisees, it was all about keeping the law. It was so important that they actually began to miss the spirit of the law. And Nicodemus is one of these Pharisees. Verse 1 also says, though, that he's a member of the Jewish ruling council. Now, this council is called the Sanhedrin. And they're an even more select group. There are 70 of these. They're the kind of top 70 of the Pharisees. And they ran the religious affairs of Israel. They had authority over every Jewish man and woman in the world. So Nicodemus is not just part of the 6,000, he's part of the 70. He's a very important man. But not only is he one of the 70, in verse 10 it says, Jesus says to Nicodemus, you are Israel's teacher. And what we now have is going from the Israel, being the chosen people, to the uh, the 6,000, the Pharisees, to the 70 of the Sanhedrin, down to one. And Jesus is saying, you know what, Nicodemus, you're it. You're the man. You're the authority. You're the teacher of Israel. And what's so incredible in this story is this, the number one, comes to Jesus. The most important man in his day. He comes to talk to Jesus. He's at the top, religious, religiously, morally, politically, socially, financially, by all of the world's standards, he is a success. And yet he seems to come to Jesus as though there's something missing. There's something not quite right. You see, the majority of the Pharisees and religious leaders, they're just putting Jesus down. They don't like what Jesus is saying. But there are some Pharisees, some rulers, and Nicodemus is one, is, who's thinking, well, he's, he's working these miracles, so he must have come from God. And he's thinking, you know, there must be something going on in this man Jesus' life that I just don't understand, and, and I want some of that. And Nicodemus realizes that he needs to redefine success, that now he's met Jesus. You know, and sometimes we need to do exactly the same. We need to redefine what success is. You know, so, so often we get caught up in, the, in our drive for success that we actually don't take the time to take a hard look at the direction we're headed in. Stephen Covey, the, the man who wrote The Seven Hab Habits of Highly Effective People, he said this, it's incredibly easy to get caught up in an activity trap. In the, now, I've spelt the word business 
wrong. It should be busyness, and I typed it out and didn't see it till later on. But it's actually quite, I thought it was quite clever later on. Okay? <laughs> In the busyness, or business, of life, to work harder and harder at climbing the ladder of success, only to discover that it's leaning against the wrong wall. And I think Nicodemus is realizing that he is the kind of prime example of that. You know, he's at the top of the ladder. Popularity, religion, riches, power. He's got all these things. But it's now, he's thinking, against the wrong wall. And that does happen to us. We think we've made it. We think because of whatever it is. Our mortgage, or our mortgage nearly being paid off, or the job we always wanted. Whatever it is that we define success as, we think we've made it, but the reality is we're against the wrong wall. And our definition of what success is has been all wrong. Let's move on. Let's look at verses uh, 2 and 3. He comes, it says, he came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. And verse 3, Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Now there in verse 3, it's that word replied which kind of jumped out at me at first. You know, Nicodemus has just made this nice statement in verse 2 about Jesus. You know that you're a good teacher, you've come from God, and God is with you, and he's been really polite. And Jesus then just kind of goes right for the jugular at Nicodemus. And he says, you know, he's been all nice and polite, and Jesus goes, you cannot find God unless you're born again. And I kind of go, whoa, where did that come from? You know, Nicodemus hasn't really even asked Jesus anything, and Jesus just kind of piles right into him. And I think, oh, Jesus, he's just slamming the main man in Israel. This is Nicodemus, the one out of everyone in Israel who deserves to be known as a follower of God. He's the one in Israel who it would appear as though he has it all together. He's got the biblical knowledge. He's got the religious understanding, the intellectual depth. He's got the power in society. He's civic-minded. He's wise. He's wealthy. And Jesus just has a go at him and says, You, Nicodemus, you, the one who thinks you've got it all together, you need to be born again. He's saying all your accomplishments, they add up to zero. If you want to know God... If you want to have any relationship with him, all of that stuff you've been doing, it's irrelevant. You have to start over. You have to become completely new. Because none of those things in your life will actually work. And what Jesus is doing here is redefining success. He's saying if you want to be a success in life, you need to be born again. And I reckon this was an incredible challenge for Nicodemus. He's a Jew. His birth was of the noblest birth. He is one of the chosen people of God, one of the elect even within that, 6,000 to 70 to 1. You know, it's like me walking up to the queen and saying, you know, queenie, you might have made something of yourself if you'd just been born into the right family. You know, that's kind of ridiculous. And that's kind of what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus. And Nicodemus could have gone, but Jesus, you know, you should be telling the Romans that. The Romans, they definitely need to be born again. But not me. I'm, I'm, a Jew. I'm the one. I'm the teacher. I'm Israel's teacher. But Jesus says, you've got to be born again. And Jesus hammers him three times with this. 
He says three times that he has to be born again. Verse 3, Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Verse 5, Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of spirit. Verse 7, you should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. I think Jesus is trying to say something here. And it's what he's trying to say is quite categorical. There's no wiggle room at all. He's saying you cannot, cannot know God unless, verse 3, 5, and 7, unless you are born again. Unless. So think about it. Unless there's air, there can be no fire. Unless there's rain, there won't be any crops. Unless you're born again, there can be no Christian. That's what he's saying. Unless, unless, unless. And Jesus just keeps on saying it. It's like he's saying, Nicodemus, are you even listening? Nicodemus, have you got it? Nicodemus, I know I've said it twice already, and I know this is hard for you, Nicodemus, but let me say it one more time just to make sure. You must be born again. You know, hundreds of years ago, John Wesley, when he was preaching in England, he he wasn't allowed to preach in the churches, and he had to go out into the streets and out into the fields to preach. And his favorite passage to preach on was this passage. And he went everywhere and he preached on this passage, saying to the people, you must be born again. And one day, a newspaper man got really fed up and got sort of tired of it. And he came to John Wesley and he said, why is it you're always preaching on the same passage, that you must be born again? And Wesley just looked at him and said, because... You must be born again. And Nicodemus keeps hearing this truth again and again and again. Be born again. Be born again. But what does it mean to be born again? Well, this phrase, it means to be born again, means to be born again. But it also means, within it, to be born from above. This one word means the two things. And so he's not just saying you need a fresh start. This is not just some kind of renewal. But he's saying it's something that comes from above. It's something spiritual that happens to us. It points to an entirely new spiritual birth. And what Jesus is saying is, You cannot be successful in this life without being born again. He's saying spirituality just cannot be added on to your life. It's not just a bolt-on or add-on to your contract. No, you've got to start again. You know, Nicodemus, he would love just to have got Jesus and added it on to his kind of spiritual portfolio. He's got the Pharisee stuff. He's got the Sanhedrin stuff. He's the teacher of the law. Maybe I could just add Jesus to my collection. Jesus could just be an add-on. No, says Jesus. You've got to be born again. You've got to start fresh, start new. But Nicodemus is coming saying, how can I reach that next pinnacle? And Jesus says, You've got to start again. Now, don't misunderstand me here. I'm not saying, and Jesus isn't saying, that we've just got to try harder. Because trying harder is all about religion. And what Jesus is talking about is rebirth, about regeneration. And there's a huge difference between religion and rebirth. Nicodemus had religion, and he had done it well. 
But Jesus is talking about rebirth. And you know, so many of the people we meet today, they think they can get close to God by religion, by keeping the commandments or some other way of doing good. But religion, it says, I can achieve God's favor by the things I do. But rebirth, regeneration says, God's love is an undeserved gift in my life. Religion says, the good in my life can somehow outweigh the sin in my life. If I can get enough good into my life, then it's somehow going to outweigh and I'll be okay. But rebirth says, Jesus' death on the cross forgave my sin. I don't need to balance out the scales. I just need to blot out my sin with the blood of Jesus. Religion says I've got to give a, a part, give up just a part of my life to this Jesus stuff. I've got to give up this habit. I better not do this thing anymore. That's religion. Rebirth says, I'm going to commit, I'm going to give all my life to him. Last week we spoke about giving. And I'd like to say, religion is just all about giving. And us actually going, mm, how much can I give? Rebirth, regeneration is saying, this is not my own. This all belongs to him. And sometimes I want to go, how can we even discuss this anymore? Because we have rebirth, regeneration. Maybe we need a lot more rebirth if we're still even discussing the fact of giving to God when he has given us so much. Re religion is all about trying hard. Rebirth is trusting him. Rebirth, trusting. And that's what it means to be born again. And when you and I, we, we say we're born again, this is amazing. It means that we're born again, that we have no past, that we're forgiven. And that we've got this bright hope, this future. And that's what makes our lives a success. But Nicodemus, he just doesn't get it at this point. So Jesus, he, he gives him a few illustrations to help him. And I'm only just going to look at one. I would love to have looked at more, but just one. Verse 14. And he says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. You see, Nicodemus, he's this law keeper. And his hero would have been Moses, the giver of the law. And so Jesus is quite clever here. And he says, let me just talk to you about your hero. And he's saying, remember the story of Moses and the snake. And what's going on in that story of Moses and the snake is the children, are being, the children of Israel are being bit, bitten by snakes and they're dying because of the snakes. And Moses goes to God and he says, God, what do we do? And, and God says, get a bronze snake on a pole and lift it up. And so when people are bitten by the snake, if they look on the snake, they will be healed. If they don't look on the snake, they will die. And that's what he is referring to, that story. And Jesus is saying, Nicodemus, it's like this. It's like that. This snake on a stick. It's all about trust. We can't figure out why this bronze thing on a stick, stuck in the ground in the desert, healed these people. We can't figure it out, why that worked. But all you need to do is look at it, Nicodemus. And the people were saved. Suppose, though, Moses had, or God had said, you know, anybody who can crawl on their hands and knees, who has enough strength to come over and touch the snake, then you'll be healed. Well, what if he had said that? Well, only the strong ones would have been saved. 
the weak ones, they would have died. But it takes no ability to look. It takes no strength to look. You know, some of the people in the desert there had been bitten, and yes, they were healthier than some of the others who had been bitten. Some were stronger, some were weaker. Some were just barely alive. But the reality is, everyone was on an equal platform. Everyone was on the same level. All they had to do was look. And that is what Jesus is saying when he says, believe. And Nicodemus is saying, but how can this be? How can somebody be born again? Jesus says, I've got to be lifted up, and then you have to look at me. You have to believe in me. And it's all kind of summed up in this idea that God's definition of success is very simple. It's looking and believing in Jesus. And for us here today, that is how we should measure our lives. You know, when we get to the end of our life, when we approach God in heaven or he approaches us, I don't know what way, he's not going to look at us and say, can I see your bank balance, please? Oh, it's a good bank balance and you come. It's not going to happen. He's not going to look at you and go, hmm, nice portfolio. He's not going to say that. He's not going to go, God, you did really well on X Factor, so in you come. He's not going to look at our Facebook or Instagram posts and go, yeah, you've achieved so much. I love that post you did 25 years ago about the dog. It was amazing. You can come in. He's not going to ask us how famous we were. He's going to ask us one question. How did you get on with trusting my son? That's it. That's a simple measure of success in our lives. If I'm going to make a success out of my life, I really shouldn't wait till the end then. I've got to take a look at each day and say, oh, how did I do today at trusting Jesus? You know, at the end of the day, if I even take the time to think about it, do I think, was this day a success or not, based on that? You know, sometimes by nine o'clock at work, I've been there already an hour and a half, and I think, oh, I'm flying. I'm ticking off everything on the to-do list, and I'm thinking, this is a great day, and everything is being done, and I think, yes, I've done it today. That is a success. And that's often how we measure success. But if I've not thought about Jesus, if I've not trusted in Jesus throughout these things, doesn't matter how many things I take off because I've just been doing them all in my own strength in my own self I need to depend on him I need to draw my strength from my relationship with him and if I was getting a lot done while looking at Jesus then that's a success Brother Lawrence speaks about peeling the potatoes in the presence of God. And that was counted as a success because he did that action in his presence. That's what success is. And Jesus is teaching Nicodemus, saying, if you want to know God, You've got to be born again. It's not about trying harder. It's not that at all. That just misses the point. It's about looking at him, about trusting him. That's what it means to live for him. That we've got to depend on that rebirth. When we say, Lord, yeah, I could do it in my own strength today, but that's not success. So we're saying, Lord, I'm going to give you my best today. 
I'm going to look at you throughout everything I do today. If I do that, then I can look back at the end of the day and say, that day was a success because I lived it in relationship with you. You know, as we come just now to, to worship, the band could come back up. I don't want us just to think about the rest of our lives. Just think about the rest of today. Think about tomorrow. Because we can only live success one day at a time. We need every morning to start again. Again, that's why we badger you about reading your Bible and praying every day. Let's not worry about next week. Let's not worry about tomorrow. Let's just build success one day at a time. One look at the cross at a time. Let's just pray together. Jesus, we come to you this morning. And you did tell us to take one day at a time, not to, to worry about the next days. So we just take today, maybe even stretch it to tomorrow. We ask you, Jesus, encourage us, help us to evaluate our lives by your standards, to evaluate our success by your definition of success. Help us to ask the question, how are we actually doing at trusting you? Do we actually look at you and trust you? And Lord, if we do evaluate ourselves, and if we think, Lord, we're just failing, Help us not to realize we need to try harder, but help us to trust more. Help us to, to look at you and to see in you the friend we need, the Savior we need, the King we need. Help us to see you, Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.